Greetings and salutations. It's Dave Duford here at Final Expense Agent Mentor, where I help agents succeed in the final expense business. And today, I have the uh, pleasure of interviewing a longtime friend in the business. His name is Christopher Westfall. And uh, what I'm going to start with is a short introduction on uh, Chris, and then we're going to get right into the questions. So, uh, Chris, how are you doing today? Excellent. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for joining so a little bit about Chris for you guys. Uh, Christopher Westfall is a licensed insurance agent specializing in the Medicare supplement business since 2009. He owns MedicareAgentTraining.com, and he helps agents around the country succeed in the Medicare supplement business. He also operates a call center helping seniors nationally with their Medicare supplement needs. And so far this year, in the current year, Chris and his team have unbelievably, it's incredible, he has sold 1,000 369 Medicare supplement policies with several more days to go. So that might get over 1400. Right, Chris? <laughs> right. We're going to get there. And on top of that, he is qualified just this year alone for five sales conventions based off of production. So uh, again, uh, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be with you, Dave. Yeah. So let's go ahead and start from the beginning. Um, a lot of my audience are probably familiar with you, although some may not be. So I'd like to kind of start with your background as to um, where you started in life, how you got into insurance, and uh, what were your reasons for doing this? Well, when I was a, a little kid growing up, I always wanted to help people, but uh, Superman was my hero. And I thought that if I grew up, the closest thing I could be to Superman was a police officer. So at the age of five, I committed my lifelong track was going to be, I was going to be a police officer. So at 19 in Florida, you can do that. And I started to uh, become a police officer at 19. I was the youngest one at my agency. Uh, no surprise there. Started off with a small city uh, police department in, in Florida. And then finally went to the county, to the sheriff's office there. Um, at the sheriff's office, after being there for three years, I was promoted to the rank of sergeant. And then for the next 13 years, um, I stayed at the rank of sergeant and always looked at the next promotion level, which was lieutenant, and what that would make me. As a sergeant, I could work overtime. So I was making about 70 or 80,000 a year. As a lieutenant, it was capped out at salary at 58,000 a year. So I went to my superiors and I said, how are you going to get quality people to move up in the ranks and accept lower pay at a salary base of 58,000 with no incentive and no overtime opportunity? And they told me, well, that's just the way it is. And being one of the lowest paid agencies in Florida, I had to do something else. So I'd had my insurance license for a while and I started doing final expense part time. So we would work two days on and two days off at the sheriff's office. And so I would do final expense on one of my two days off. And my goal, and I hit my goal most every day I can remember, was to make $1,000 a day and then quit and then go home and be with the family. So it really helped to supplement my income. And that's basically how I got started doing insurance. Right. So you came into this business, like most people, uh, selling insurance was probably the last thing you ever imagined yourself doing, I'd imagine. Correct. That's true. That's true. <laughs> it's funny how we kind of stumble into things that, uh, you know, we have no conceiving of. I remember when I was getting into insurance, uh, the last thing I ever thought about doing was life insurance. I couldn't imagine a lease sexy job, <laughs> <laughs> right. but you know, circumstances put us in positions, right? So, yeah. um, so you said you started with final expense and uh, obviously today uh, you're not selling final expense. What was the transition from final expense to Medicare like, and why did you make that transition? When I first got started, um, I was all alone. I didn't know anybody else in the industry. So I spent a lot of time online with insurance discussion forums, uh, learning from other people and their their mistakes and their, you know, their discoveries in the industry. And I learned about the concept of uh, residual income. And I thought that residual income uh, versus what I was doing, because it's, it felt like at times I was taking two steps forward and one step back, two steps forward and one step back. And um, the concept of residual income seemed really neat to me. So I started, um, I started making a little bit of a change with my focus. I started learning about Medicare. It seemed like it was really complicated. And in Florida, everything's Medicare Advantage. So the supplements that I was learning so much about, I, I really couldn't sell those in Florida because the, the prices were just out of whack and the competition with Medicare Advantage was so crazy. One other thing that, that really struck me is I walked into a McDonald's one day and had an epiphany. 
I kid you not, I walked into McDonald's and I saw all the senior citizens sitting around. And then so I started to listen, what are they talking about? You know, I'm a life insurance agent, final expense. What are they talking about at these tables? They're talking about their knee replacement, their hip replacement. Dr. So-and-so is a great orthopedic guy. You know, this guy's sick. And where's Billy today? Oh, he's sick. He's, you know, in the hospital. So I started thinking, you know, and all these things started happening at one time. I started thinking, well, everybody's talking about their health and their doctor and their health plan. Nobody's talking about death and dying or what life insurance policy do you have? Um, and then it so happened that that part of the year, the televisions are on in all the restaurants, the television's on at the house. And all I would see everywhere were these seemingly billions of dollars of ads spent on Medicare, 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 Medicare. And I'm like, wow, that's really focusing the whole senior population on one product, Medicare, Medicare. Wouldn't it be neat to kind of slip into that downstream of on everybody's consciousness of Medicare? They're talking about it in McDonald's. It's all over the TV. It's in the radio. It's in the newspaper. Full page ads of Humana down there. So I started thinking, if this is the way toward residual income and just getting into that stream and the consciousness is already there and the discussions are already there, maybe that's something I need to start making a transition to. So that's kind of why I started doing um, one day a week. When I left the sheriff's office, I went full time in the final expense. So then I started doing and started making a lot more money. And uh, I started going from that to one day a week of focusing on Medicare. Now, nobody was doing it over the phone that I knew of back then. Uh, this was nine years ago, and only one company had an electronic application. So it was very difficult, and I was doing mail, uh, I mean, actually sending packets through the mail to people. And I remember wow. one week, and uh, I sent 13 packets out, and then I got back five more. I got a, a five out of that 13. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I can actually sell this stuff over the phone. Again, because Florida was not very conducive to MedSubs, but I started selling in Michigan, and um, then I kind of realized maybe I should do two days a week because I'm building monthly income. Maybe I should do three days a week. And then finally just broke free and just did all Medicare. So, so you know, I, I know personally a lot of agents, they'll start with one particular product, be it final expense or something else, and then they see something else that they want to do and potentially transition to it. And I think one of the most difficult things is to, to walk the line for both products to be successful in both. Mm -hmm. Obviously you have done that. And so what I'm asking is for the guys that may be thinking based on what you're saying, they like the idea of transitioning to maybe Medicare or something else. What, what kind of advice would you give somebody that wants to be able to transition without losing effectiveness in their, so we say their bread and butter type of insurance line they're selling? Well, I, I really have seen over working with about 3,000 agents in the last five years, um, a real dichotomy. One way is you've got an agent who's really, and I have to just put this out there and be completely transparent. One agent is, tr is supported by their spouse um, and their spouse is really the breadwinner and they're out there trying different things more as a hobby than a profession. Those guys I really can't help because they're not going to have the level of immersion into the culture necessary to make it successful. They're not going to try hard enough. If it gets a little bit uh, of resistance in there, things don't go their way. They don't understand the answer to a question and they're not going to go open an underwriting guide to get the answer. They're just going to pack it up and go, see, honey, I tried this. It didn't work. Uh, the other type of person is a person who has burned the bridges behind them. They have no more career to go back to. This is where they've decided to put their focus and they're all in. They're not dipping their toe in the pool. They have jumped into the deep end of the pool. No matter what it takes, they feel like they treat the business like they've invested their entire life savings. And by God, if somebody else can do it, I can do the same thing. And I'm going to figure out the answers to the things I don't know the answers to. Those kind of people will succeed no matter which focus that they go into our, our industry. I know people who make a great living at long-term care, people who fo focus on mortgage protection term. And the only thing that's unique about those people that I've seen is that 100% burn your bridge behind you, nowhere else to go, you've got to make this work. And again, if somebody, and I found one mentor when I got started doing it over the phone, there's a guy in Texas that uh, my first FMO that I found put me in touch with on the phone. And the guy said, yes, it's possible. We do it all day long. Nobody else is doing it, but yes, it can be done. 
And that's the trigger that I needed. That's all I needed to know. He didn't tell me exactly who to sell, how to sell it, how to get the signatures over the phone. None of that detail stuff, none of the technical. He just said, the concept works. It's a proven concept and it absolutely works. So with that proof of concept, I just jumped all in. And it's those agents who decide to do that and make that mental decision. And it's all mental. When they make that decision, then there's no, no stopping them and there's no end to the income that you can build. You know, it's funny as I do these profiles of success, not just in life insurance or insurance in general, but just in, in success in life. It, it many times, the people who are successful seem to have all the odds against them. You know, sometimes I've thought in my, my tougher days where I think, man, if I didn't have a wife, if I didn't have kids, if I didn't have these financial obligations, I'd make it. You know, and I know some people think the same thing too, but you've got a lot of kids, you're married, I've got a lot of kids, I'm married, and for some way, somehow, if there's a will, there's a way, and if you just yeah. apply yourself, it's amazing the kind of results you can get, whereas what you're saying just a minute ago is so true, there's some people that just don't have the fire burning underneath yeah. them to go out there and give it their all because, frankly, they don't have to. They're comfortable. They've got, comfortable. Them They've got some yeah. sort of thing in their way and, and you're, you're hundred percent true. You, you really have to risk it all yeah. if you really want the big, the big success. It's just, that's, that. it's so true for, for so many successful people, probably all. Very true. So you transitioned into Medicare, um, took you some time. You were obviously doing something very few people were doing back in the dark ages of Medicare yeah. when we didn't have yeah. electronic applications, telephonic sales, uh, again, there's, there's a will, there's a way. Um, what are your thoughts for the guys that, I talk to a lot of agents, I know you do too, that love the idea of selling over the phone, but they've got this sort of knee-jerk concern. Is it's, They've heard it from other people. You can't sell over the phone. You have to sell face-to-face. -face. What, what is your thoughts on the differences between selling over the phone selling face to face and um, how one can be successful with both because you obviously have done both. You know, that old story about uh, an elephant that's tethered to a rope and he can't go anywhere. And then they take the rope away and it still doesn't go anywhere because it's so used to being confined within its own restrictions that were placed there before. And I find that that is so true in our industry where we have, I see it every day. I'll, I'll see an older seasoned agent who's been in the business for 30, 40, 50 years tell me they've been around forever and that phone thing just can't be done. Meanwhile, I've got my son when he's 20 years old selling 13 policies a week over the phone and he's never been told it can't be done. So he doesn't know any different. Millennials all over the place. I interviewed uh, one of my agents is uh, on a company trip with me from Iceland two years ago, we're on this company trip in Iceland and we're talking about the fact that here he is 19 years old and qualifying for a trip. How does that happen? It's because in their mind, again, they don't have the restriction of, oh no, it can't be done. It absolutely can be done. It's all the switch in the mind of, uh, if it works, it works. And I think that with agents, sometimes they think that they just can't do it and they're right. And then other agents yeah. think, well, look, it's being done. So I, I can do it, and they're right too. Um, I think one thing about uh, selling over the phone that people have to realize is it's all about scalability. And my wife hates it when I use this term, but I use it all the time. It's the cookie-cutter approach. I love that. If something happens on a micro and you can add scale to it and grow it on a macro level, just doing the same exact thing, that's scalability. And what I found about selling over the phone is, um, you know, the Bible talks about if, if one can put uh, one, uh, one to flight, whatever it is, two could put 10,000 to flight. It's growing exponentially. And that's what I found here in, in my office. I was selling over the phone, seeing 10 times the people, literally I could see 10 people in an hour and a half or two hours to have a conversation with them to see if it's going to go anywhere to prospect them and see if there's any qualification there to move forward. Doing the same thing in the field, I might be able to reach uh, three conversations in a day, maybe five, maybe eight if I push it for an all day event. But I'm talking about an hour and a half here of getting through the yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Mike Brooks has a wonderful training called the top 20%. And he studied how the top 20% of phone salespeople from all different industries separate themselves from the other 80%. And the biggest key difference is sorting early. 
eliminating as quick as you can those people who you're not going to move forward with. Don't do it for the, just the being nice of having a conversation because they will talk to you all day and never stop. You have to really separate the wheat from the chaff. Take the best that you can and tell everybody else, I'm sorry, you're in a good position. Stay where you're at. Well, you can do that kind of scalability over the phone so much more than you could do it face-to-face uh, -face with what I call windshield time of just driving to see people. So imagine, if you can see 10 times as many people, see, I say see, talk to them over the phone, have a conversation with them and weed them out, and you only are 50% as effective as you could be face-to-face. -face. For the agents who say, oh no, people won't buy over the phone, bet me, they buy over the phone all day long, but let's just go with that premise. Let's just say that you're, 50% as effective. So, oh my gosh, you're only going to close half of what you would have closed if you were face to face. Yes, but I can talk to 10 times as many people. So it's that margin of scalability that gives a 50% at minimum boost on my income. And then you look at scalability. So in my office, I've got five other agents in here. So we can all be talking on the phone at the same time to people and bringing in more and more and more quality people. And everything that works is the true in the insurance where you're going to get so many people out there, so many policies, and they're going to start referring people. Well, imagine that on a mass scale. All your existing clients are happy with your emails. They're happy with your cards in the mail. And then based on that, they start referring people. And then it just starts to grow like a mushroom cloud. So I think selling over the phone, even if you give them the benefit of saying it's only 20% effective. Okay, great. You just made a huge improvement in what you could do if you're just solely relying on your tires and your oil and your car and your gas and your tank. I drive a Tesla now, so I don't have to pay for gas. But if those who drive the gas cars, um, you don't have to worry about that if you're sitting there and you're 10 times more productive. And I like doing it in spurts where you can sit there, do a whole bunch of um, not prospecting because I have other people do that, but qualifying. Qualify, qualify, qualify. Get up, go to lunch, have a good time, hang out. You've still accomplished more in that day, I would argue, than an agent who gets up and drives an hour, two hours to their work area and then starts knocking on doors. And I just think the effectiveness and the scalability is what's all about. Well, let's, let's, kind, of, uh, let's kind of expand on the scalability from the perspective of a newer agent that maybe want to jump into Medicare sales. What, what activities that they're doing can be scaled or outsourced in order to, for them, like you said, to spend more time with qualified prospects? Well, for, when I first got started, um, I started working with somebody in the Philippines. I learned that you can telemarket using $3 an hour labor instead of what I was used to at the sheriff's office, $25 an hour labor with me on the phone all the time. And then I started reading books like The 4-Hour Workweek with Tim Ferriss and all these books about people who have scaled up their business so much by outsourcing. So I started it. I went to a website, found somebody. Her name was Beverly. She was with me for over three years. I had to go through five other ones, though, that didn't work out before I found the good telemarketer. And then every day, she got better and better and better. But every day, she would go out, prospect with my simple script, asking if people are interested in saving money on their Medicare supplement plan. Have you been in the hospital in the last year? Something like that. It was very basic at the time. And then I would get a list every day of people who were interested in talking to me. Then I transitioned her into saying, look, if you're interested, I'm going to put you on the phone with Mr. Westbond. She would build me up, like edify me before I got on the phone. That was so key. She would then give them my website. And so they would spend some time on my website, seeing me, hearing me, uh, finding out they could know, like, and trust me before we even got on the phone. So my level of credibility when I finally got on the phone was way up here. That was a big difference. So I no longer had to prospect. And that, as I find with agents, is 90% of the stress of doing the Medicare business is the prospecting, the constant rejection. And the good thing is there are people on the other side of the world who would kill to do that for $3 an hour, who are loyal, who will show up every day. They speak 90% great English, good enough to be effective at, at helping you scale your business. Like my son right now, like I said, he just turned 22. But he's got seven telemarketers on the other side of the world constantly feeding him new leads every day. So he's talking to the cream of the crop only. And he's just found that he's cranking out applications all the time because he's no longer doing the $3 an hour work because work is valued at whatever the lowest price is somebody's willing to do that for. So if you are you know, making $100,000 a year, but you're doing $3 an hour labor, somebody else is willing to do that. Even if they can't do it, at 50% uh, of your effectiveness, get them to do it and then scale them up at $3 an hour. 
so that you can do the bigger things, which is uh, qualifying those people and then getting them in the applications. And in my case, I found another licensed insurance agent, put him in the qualifying seat. So it went from cold call to a qualifier who only set appointments for me to do the applications. And then that's when everything started rocketing up. And, and before I forget, Chris, you do have a program in which you help uh, agents in the Medicare business uh, do exactly uh, what you're talking about, finding reps overseas to do the qualification. Can you talk a little bit about that for anybody who's interested in possibly uh, leveraging the same? Yeah, I started telling that story a couple of years ago about how I got started. And for, for somebody who doesn't have a big social media presence, who doesn't go out there and buy online leads and, and go to internet conferences all year like I do to study all that stuff, how would they best position themselves given a limited budget to get their business started? So I say, look, you should start like I did with a telemarketer. And now we have a business called trainedtelemarketers.com and all that business is is a team of people both in the US and in the Philippines who constantly recruits, trains, and gets people set up on the predictive dialer so that these people are ready to go turnkey and they can just go at it. We've sold 350 telemarketers through that service in the last year. And what I've seen in my agency is for those agents who have contracts with me, and a lot of them don't, but those who have contracts with me, you know, that old saying, a rising tide raises all ships. I've seen the massive increase in the agency production. I think we're number seven as an agency in the United States for Cigna production this year, solely because the agents have people to talk to and they've got somewhere to go to get that prospecting thing off their plate and somewhere else. So I'm not trying to, to pitch train telemarketers, but just having that service that we saw a need, we saw a need, everybody's spending so much time trying to find the good person. So we figured, hey, why don't we just make an entity, put a team together that does nothing but that, so that the agent can again go back to selling and doing what they do best. Yeah, and, and thank you for explaining that, because I've, I've actually had a couple agents that have done business that work with me, but have done business with the trained telemarketers program you have, and they love it. Uh, mm -hmm. They've had great success with it. And then there's a lot of guys that would benefit from that. So I wanted to make sure that we mentioned that. Um, kind of building on uh, back to what you do. Now, one interesting thing that I think agents will find is that, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, mm -hmm. you don't sell any Medicare Advantage. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. No, none, zero, just Medicare none. supplements. And That's there's right. a lot of guys out there who just think, how can I actually make a living selling Medicare without selling Medicare Advantage as well? What's yeah. your thoughts on that? And could you kind of expand on that? Four years ago, I moved from Florida to our current home in Charleston, South Carolina. We just love the culture. We love the area. And so here I had the opportunity to do Medicare Advantage if I wanted to or Medicare supplements, but I'd have to do it more in person because here's, here's what I found. The Kaiser Family Foundation at the beginning of 2017 uh, they found that there are 2,034 different Medicare Advantage plans across the United States. Now, I'm licensed in 46 states, so I have a big view of the country. With Medicare supplements, we have Plan G, Plan F, Plan N that we sell. They're the same plan across the country. Same exact benefits, same plan, very, keep it simple, stupid, very easy plans. I cannot uh, fathom becoming an expert or even a, a walking idiot to sell somebody a plan with 2,034 different variations around the country. Uh, and then the same, the same study showed that last year, 238 of those plans left the market. And then 271 new plans came into the market just in one year. So of that disruption, 400,000 seniors lost their plan because it was leaving the market. Now, I think that's horrible for seniors. They've, they've been dumped off their plan on Medicare Advantage, but what happens to the agents that wrote that plan? They've got to scramble and replace that business, and they can do it during the annual election period, a small, finite window of opportunity during the year. So what I decided was with Medicare supplements, I can sell it all year long. I can sell it from January 1 to December 31st. No difference. I can sell it all year. With Medicare Advantage, I can sell it from October 15 to December 7, that's the window and I'm done. What I saw in Florida with my friends that were agents that I ended up meeting in Florida, they all had to do Medicare Advantage. And every year during the annual election period, somebody would lose a great deal of their business because a carrier would leave the market. When that happens, and it happens in Florida quite often, they would have to scramble to rewrite all those people 
and the people that they did have, they'd have to do a policy review with them during the annual election period, a small window of time. So when do you go gather new customers if all you're doing is replacing and servicing your existing block, block of people? You reach a barrier to which one person can even, you know, handle that, service that line of business. With Medicare supplements, there's no service work involved. Nobody's calling me saying, uh, you know, that I was char charged the wrong copay or my doctor left my network. No, it's any doctor in the country that accepts Medicare. Or my hospital didn't renew their contract with this company. What am I going to do? And my friends, again, who focus on Medicare Advantage get those calls every single day. People yelling at them, screaming at them, threatening them to sue them, all that kind of stuff. So the regulation is huge. You've got to get a scope of appointment form before you can have a sales conversation with somebody. All the marketing you can do is eliminated from what I would look at. You can't do your own direct mail. It has to be approved. You can't do telemarketing whatsoever. You can't knock on somebody's door. You can't prospect online unless everything's been pre-approved by CMS. So there's a couple of reasons why I think it's so better to focus. You know, I've always heard the, the statement that the riches are in the niches. And when I have a little niche of Medicare supplement, that's not to say that if somebody calls me and says, I need a Medicare Advantage plan, I just say, tough luck, you're on your own. But I found a referral partner that I refer that business to that's an expert solely in Medicare Advantage that won't try to take my other business. So if somebody needs a Medicare Advantage plan, I can't help them, I can't insure them, they're, they're just stuck. I can send over to a referral partner who focuses just on Medicare Advantage and it's a win-win for everybody. I do though, I, I think it's important to say, you can't really make a comparison and a full presentation to somebody about the benefits of Medicare supplement without also being certified in Medicare Advantage. So every year I take the AHIP certification course. I maintain licenses and contracts and appointments with three of the top companies, um, Humana, Aetna, and Cigna on the Medicare Advantage side. My father-in-law actually is on a Medicare Advantage plan that I wrote for him. He's in Florida. He's got the license there too. So I keep into it as to what's going on with Medicare Advantage and do the certification every year to know what their marketing guidelines are and how it fits really what's new in the world of Medicare Advantage and how Medicare supplement still still is a better way to go. Yeah, I mean, it just, just by listening to it, it's obvious that Medicare is just so simplified and it's so yeah. homogenous across the nation that if your goal is to sell over the phone in different states and to scale up like yeah. you've done, why even mess with Medicare Advantage? That's my point, yeah. So continuing on here, next question for you is uh, obviously – uh, you use a lot of social media. Uh, social media is something that I use as well in my recruiting business, especially. Uh, works fantastic. And uh, what I want to ask you is how important is social media as a source of prospecting for your Medicare supplement business? And in and, and general, how would you suggest agents incorporate social media into their business models to become more successful? Um, every year, we, we've been lucky to go on a bunch of company trips. Um, you know, we went to... Um, Berlin last year, and like I said, Iceland and Rome and all these faraway places. It's been beautiful. And we, we meet the agents there, and the agents, the top producers from all these companies, they always get together, and they have probably about the third night of the trip, the discussion comes up, well, how do you get business? How do you get business? How do you get business? And then the discussion comes up, and a lot of these young guys that run call centers will always have a debate about their cost of client acquisition, their cost of acquisition, and how many months out will it be on the residual income train before they're profitable on what they spent to acquire that new customer. And I just sit there and I listen quietly because my cost of acquisition is zero. It doesn't cost a thing to get the 1,300 policies that we've gotten so far this year. And they don't understand that, and certainly they don't have to come in and try to compete with me in that exact space by any means. But it's important for anybody, I believe, especially as we're getting into an age where the giant corporations are trying to encroach upon anything that is direct to consumer. We're seeing Amazon now coming into the pharmacy space. It's going to totally disrupt that space that was direct to consumer before by everybody else who's tried it. So when the likes of Amazon and Walmart start pushing Medicare supplements, because they are commoditized, they are the same thing. When they start pushing those products direct to consumer with a billion dollar budget, what can the independent agent do? I would argue that the only way to remain relevant as an independent agent is to start your branding now. You have to be found, 
If you, if you start the conversation with somebody or your marketing team or your telemarketer starts the conversation with somebody and they want to know who are you, when they Google search you and they will Google search you, what are they going to find? You can control 100% of what they find online. You can control the reviews. You can control where you're found online, what they see about you, your message that you get out there. So the unique position that I'm in, because I decided to go all in with social media when I moved to South Carolina and left my marketing people behind, all I started to do was put out content across YouTube, Facebook, um, and then synthesize that content and spread it out all over the internet. And what I found is when people call in, they don't want to know who I am. They don't want to know what I have. They want to know what should they do. So they're like, hey, I, I, I call, I'm calling in because I saw Chris's video on this topic. What plan should I go with? Here's my zip code. Tell me. And then they just sign up. Because it goes back to that people buy from who they know, like, and trust. And the weird thing about working online and putting your message out there, your branding all the time consistently is they will already know you when they call in. They feel like they've known you forever. We had this week, this is a funny story. We had this week our second client. Since I've lived in South Carolina now four years, our second client came into my office and I saw them in person. Just the second one. And I've got his photograph around here somewhere. I took a picture of it because it's so unusual. But he came in, shook my hand because he happened to be passing through town, going to a wedding, and just wanted to see me and shake my hand for our staff having helped him so much in saving money on his Medicare plan. But that's the unusual part. But the thing is, when he walked in, he's like, man, I feel like I'm meeting a celebrity. That's weird. It's weird, but it, it happens all the time. And then we get together with agent training events. Like we did uh, two live events where agents came from around the country this past year. And when they come there, they're like, wow, you're taller than I imagine, but I feel like I know you because all this stuff that you put out on video. So I think even at a small level, if you don't want to become a YouTube star, every agent should control the conversation with when somebody searches you, what are they going to find? You need to build that picture as a brand or else be lost in the sea of commodity, which is of every other insurance agent. And, you know, this week, I'm, my big project is I'm working on reviewing websites that my agents have. They've asked me to review their websites to see what they could do better. And the biggest thing that I'm finding is their websites are stuffy, they're boring, they're corporate looking, they're just so, they're sterile. There's no kind of personality to them. Nothing jumps out and says, hi, I'm a person, let me solve your needs. And that's what agents have to do if they're going to remain relevant in a world of commoditization with Amazon and Walmart, all these companies looking to come in. What's going to separate you from everybody else? First, you have to grab their attention. You can do that through a myriad of ways. But once you have it, you have to keep their attention and they have to know you as a person. So you can't hide behind black and white text and a 16-point font on a website. They've got to really be drawn in to you and you've got to build a connection with them. Otherwise, you're just like everybody else out there just trying to sell something. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, you know, you look at the world and, and the business world as it stands and anywhere where there is a middleman that's being eliminated. That's right. Uh, Amazon is at the forefront of it. Uh, so many businesses are shuttering up, um, you know, that were traditional uh, bulwarks and long-term successful. Have, everything's changed and, and it will affect us in some way and somehow. And um, as I've always told agents, you know, if we're, we're a necessary evil and companies are always looking for ways to eliminate any cost and we're a cost component to doing the business. So by adding value in different ways, totally agree. Uh, you have to, you must, yeah. because as time goes on, postage prices are going up. It's going to be more expensive, more costly, more competitive in those markets uh, to make a living. Yeah. And it's very sensible to take time to, uh, invest in yourself and uh, do things like what you do for sure. Uh, question uh, for you, um, kind of building on this whole radical uh, 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 change in how business is being done. With the advent of automation and technological advancements, uh, we, all, all we hear about now is robots doing humans mm -hmm. work. Where do you see the insurance business, specifically the Medicare supplement in the next 10 to 20 years? And what will agents have to do to to continue high levels of production? The good thing is that there will always be a need for the insurance agent, I feel, because the government, if you just look at uh, what we're spending, like the majority of the budget 
is on what they call entitlements, and it really makes my clients mad when they hear the word entitlement. I'm not entitled, I earn that Medicare benefit, and they're right. So when the government's spending all this money on the entitlement part of the budget, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, they're going to have to pair that back. Either pair it back or, you know, just go bankrupt and the government shut down. That's not going to happen. So in the next couple of years, I believe that we're going to see the Congress, if it's still a Republican Congress, to be sure, trying to find some way to cut back Social Security uh, for the younger people like us. We're never going to get it. And also cut back Medicare benefits to some extent or transition it more to the private um, partnership of private companies running the Medicare. All of those things are going to require an agent to step in with a solution. Now, another thing about my focus on Medicare supplements versus Medicare Advantage, you know, at the Medicare convention last year, some girl who was a, a representative of an FMO got really angry at me. We're having those, one of those night discussions in the bar about Medicare. What do you mean you don't go after the Medicare Advantage? You're just, uh, what'd you say, something like, you're rich and you're discriminating against the people who are poor. I'm like, That's discrimination. Ah. <laughs> I've just chosen my <laughs> market. Of course come to that. <laughs> and I think that, you know, people, there, so many agents don't understand when they're used to doing Medicare Advantage only, which usually costs nothing and they just need a signature and they're done. The idea of getting somebody to pay a premium for an insurance policy is foreign to many agents, which I don't understand. But there are many seniors who have actually done this thing called saving money for retirement. And those people who have saved money for retirement, those people who have a pension from a really good corporation and all that kind of stuff, they want more than the government is willing to allow, especially when that government benefit starts chipping down and starts going away. So the bigger the gap between what they expect and what they want from their old corporate life to fill that hole of their benefits to what the government is willing to give is going to get greater and greater different. And that's where the agent's always going to have an advantage by coming in with a supplemental benefit, whether it's going to be a cancer policy, a life policy that they're not going to get, obviously, with the burial from the government. Um, the Medicare supplement to bridge that gap between what's available and what they expect. And they've got the money to pay for it. They're you know, talking about the biggest transfer of wealth is happening this generation from the baby boomers to the younger generation. These people have money. Don't be fooled in thinking that they're all broke and they're all destitute because they're not. And those people who have money will always pay for the better benefits. And I think that's always going to be a position for agents to come in there and, and provide that need for them. And, and luckily, too, especially those with the money, they do value consultation Absolutely. and service. And, yeah. and they will pay for that. And in many ways, that's a great thing, right? I mean, Absolutely. Uh, unlike a lot of other sales positions, uh, having insurance agents come in and help them with their insurance is still something that a majority still wants. So, yep. you know, we're not, we're not used cars, but salesmen yet. So, and I don't Especially think. Especially when they find out, you know, it doesn't cost a dime more to have my personalized individual help than if you went straight to the carrier. So let me help you for free in essence, because my, my advice is free. I get paid by the company. And when they get that, they're like, Oh, why wouldn't I work with you? I don't want to call a call center, a big corporation. I'd love to have your help. So yeah, it definitely works. Right. Absolutely. So as we wind down our, our conversation here, Chris, uh, I always ask this, this question. I think it's going to go back to a lot of what we said in the beginning. What do you think the number one reason is that agents fail in the insurance business? There's so much opportunity here. Why do 90% plus fail out within the first year? If I put it this way, if an agent treated this business like it was a McDonald's franchise that they had saved up their whole life for, then mortgage their house for, then borrowed from their in-laws every dime that they could muster from everybody around them. And they were that much motivated to go in and make this work at the McDonald's, to work from day to night, to hire the team, to work with the team, to inspire the team, to make sure that everything in the restaurant is set up correctly, knowing full well, they're not going to make a dime on their investment, no RI whatsoever for the first five years. That, that kind of commitment is the mindset that's needed to work in this industry and make it 100% success. The problem with the industry is there's such a low barrier to entry. An agent can, for about $200 and 40 hours of sitting in a classroom, with a pie-in-the-sky dream that they're going to be a millionaire based on the fact that they've got that license, it always, I, I save them all the time. I get voicemails every week from agents who say, I'm a licensed agent and I'm calling you because I'm going to talk to you about my business. I'm a licensed agent. Well, that license 
and a dollar fifty might get you a crappy cup of coffee at McDonald's. It's not worth a dad gum thing, that license. The mindset behind it, as if they spent eight years of medical school or 12 years of medical school to get that license, if they treated it like that, that the value of what it holds, the inherent value within that license is all of what you do with it. And they just don't appreciate and value enough what that license could do for them. So could they too make over a million dollars a year in residual income and have a staff of people that's super happy because we do trips together all the time? Yes, they could. And what did it take to do that? That little license is it. But it's the mindset of, wow, how far can we go? How big can we scale this up? And I know call center owners in their 20s in Florida that are doing 400 policies a week with their call center because they see the vision, they want to run with it, they're willing to work day and night for it, and they're not accepting any excuses because they caught the vision and they know that it works. So an agent that has no vision, an agent who has no drive, an agent who does not have the expectation that if they don't get off their butt and do something with it, they're gonna be on the street next week. Without that motivation, the insurance license is completely useless, it's a waste of time, and they need to go get a job where somebody hits them on the ass every day and says, you need to clock in, don't clock in late. And we all know people like that. They're just better off in an hourly job. But the people who are driven by incentive, the people who are driven by the goal of doing something much better than any employer could ever offer them, it takes that kind of mindset. And I think that's why we're the same on this, working on mindset, working on training your, your brain as to what's available out there, what's possible to do, and working on you yourself. That's the most important thing. It's not the technical thing of, what product can I sell today? Or where can, where's the best market? What's the secret script? There's got to be a secret script behind it. All that stuff is crap and it doesn't matter. Um, what Jim Rohn says is what you lack in skill, you can make up in numbers. And it's so true in this business. If you prospect 10 times more than the guy who barely gets out of bed, but he's good on the phone, then you're going to win. You're going to beat him every time. And it's available to do that if you're doing a scalable business where you can prospect 10 times more and talk to 10 times more people. Um, so it all just comes down to motivation, mindset, making that decision that I've got the best opportunity available out there. It only cost me $200 to get here, but look what I can do. I know that I can make a million dollars a year if I work at it long enough and hard enough, get good people to come in and work with me. And the thing about hiring people that so many people are afraid of is they're like, I can't afford that, I can't afford that. And I thought the same thing when I first hired my first assistant. How am I going to afford that? But when I sequentially started to double my business based on his production, and I get another person in here to help me, and now I'm tripling my business, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, even if my margin is half as much, but I've got a team of five people, oh my gosh, we're doing so much more business. And then looking at the compounding effect of residual income, if we sell 1,300 policies this year, each one worth $1,500, and we did the same thing last year, our monthly income just continues to go up based on that. Anyway, it's catching the, the dream, catching the vision, putting it into action, and not quitting even when you have the little obstacles that are inherent in any business. You know you're gonna have obstacles. And whether it's you know my training help or anybody else that, that's out there, they're not gonna cover every single situation and nuance and every weird thing that can happen. It's what you do in those margins though, when you're on your own and you have to either call the carrier to get help or ask another agent, or look on an online forum, or figure it out yourself, what do you do in that? You could either quit and say, this is too complicated, I'm out of this business. Or you could press on, become a business owner, act like an entrepreneur, fake it till you make it, practice it till you perfect it, get the answer, and then wing it if you have to, correct it after the fact, but get through that application, get through the process. That's the difference between, I believe, a business person versus an employee. And if they've got the business person, business owner mindset, they feel like and they treat it like they've invested a lot into it, then um, you just can't lose with a system that works. Well said. And I, I'd like to add just a little personal thoughts here. You know, I, I think in a way, uh, all of us should be thankful that this business is tough and that mm -hmm. people do fail. Uh, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it and we'd be paid a clerk's wage. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a reason why we face this, you know, the, the difficulties that every single person who's made it has to face. You know, I, I always tell people, look, if you haven't seriously thought about quitting like this job at one point, you probably haven't been into the business long enough. Uh, there's there's very few people that uh, go through this unscathed 
And that's part of the trial by fire yeah. process that every agent must go through in order to achieve you know, high levels of success. And, um, you know, it's just the way it is. And uh, I've learned to embrace that instead of complain. But it's worth it. It's that, worth it. That's right. Because it's much better than working for the man. I <laughs> that's right. So, Chris, as we wrap up here, uh, tell us uh, again, remind everybody, where can we find you? Uh, where can we learn more about you if we're interested in talking to you about Medicare or learning about your training programs? And let me just preface this by saying I, it was not my idea to help other agents when I first got started. When I was doing this stuff over the phone, I came up with this online signature method where we used, uh, back in the day, a PDF application for MedSup, because that's all we had. And we could do a screen share and a pen tool from Adobe Acrobat, and si the customer could sign their signature using the mouse from their house. And when I came up with that process, um, a big FMO by the name of AmeriLife started spreading the word because people started wanting to sell over the phone. So I started getting hundreds of calls from agents saying, how are you doing that? What are you doing? What are you doing? So I put together a little website where I could say, okay, here's what I'm doing. Here's what's happening. And then it was like um, six months or a year later, I realized there were 600 people that were members of this website. And I'm like, maybe I should charge money so I could actually spend the time and be compensated for helping people for free. So I started a membership site and it's called MedicareAgentTraining.com. And on that website, I just chronicle what we're finding that works, what's happening with the carriers, what the new opportunities are and, and stuff like that. It's very basic, but it's helped a lot of people. So far, 2,800 people have come back and said, this is positive, it helped me get ramped up and now I'm on my own doing my own thing. Because there's just not a lot of training out there for actual prospecting, actual closing, actual um, doing a Medicare conversation over the phone and then, you know, figuring out how to grow and scale your business. So I figured I'd uh, fill something in the niche there. So that's what that is. Perfect. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure uh, sharing Thanks, your man. experience and uh, have a Merry Christmas. You too, Dave. Thanks so much. All right, man.